when you think about the context, your point of how humans evolved, we live like that all the time because we didn't know where our next meal might come from very often. We didn't know what the weather would bring. We didn't know what was happening next. And we were having to really work and uh, struggle to survive. And there is probably something rewarding to that and to be in the moment and to have to work to get the things that you get really on a deep level and be just kind of in it, like you are in it, you know? And um, yeah, so I think that the takeaway for the average person is how is not to go to Baghdad, let me say that. <laughs> it is, how can you do things in your life that maybe reflect that a little bit? Hey everyone, welcome to The Drive Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Atia. Michael, thanks for making the trip to Austin. Yeah. Thanks for having me again. It's good to yeah. be here. And congrats on the uh, on the book. Well, thank you very much. And congrats on yours. Thanks so much. So last time we were here, we were talking about uh, The Comfort Crisis, which is a book people have heard me talk about over and over and over again. It's it's on the short list of books you know I, I recommend uh, regularly. Um, but I want to kind of understand how you went from the obvious success of the comfort crisis, and more importantly, the lessons you learned in the comfort crisis to thinking about the particular problem that feeds into scarcity brain. Yeah, so I finished the comfort crisis basically right as the pandemic was taking off. So March, 2020. Now, when the pandemic takes off, what does everyone do? They go to the grocery store and they hoard as much stuff as they can. Right, we're gonna get all the canned food we have, we can get, we're gonna get all the toilet paper, we're gonna get all the hand sanitizer. This is a rational decision at that point, but it made me sort of realize, oh, when when we think that resources are scarce, our reaction is to hoard them and gather them, right? And I think what was interesting about the pandemic is you had this initial spike in that sort of behavior, but then sort of as it uh, drew out, you saw everything from drinking and drug use increase, you saw purchasing, increase you saw a lot of people gain weight eating food and exercising less and so you saw all these behaviors um that can be damaging just sort of increase over time and so that made me sort of wonder uh, about questions of scarcity how it affects us um how our environments have changed because that's what the comfort crisis is ultimately about and one of the elements underlying that is that we do live in a world where we have an abundance of all these things we're built to crave and managing that can be difficult you know, I was thinking about where to start because th there are so many sections in this book, each of which dive into seemingly disparate topics uh, of scarcity, right? Well, and we'll talk about them all, right? We'll talk about scarcity of information, scarcity of food. Um, but maybe we start with food because I think it is the most obvious one, at least to me. Um, also, it's the one for which there is the most obvious evolutionary link. Um, now, there are scholars out there who would argue that the greatest superpower of the Homo sapiens uh, are their ability to tell stories, and I've I've I've, I've heard this said, and and I, uh, that makes sense. Um, maybe it's just my own bias in biology, but I've always felt that our superpower as Homo sapiens was energy storage. Um, and it's probably the case that there are many superpowers that we have that that coalesced around. Um, where we are today and how we kind of leapfrogged ahead of every other species about 250,000 years ago. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what we know about scarcity with respect to nutrition and how that evolved us as a species. Yeah, well, I mean, in the past, re until very recently, food was scarce and it was hard to find. I mean, especially prehistorically, like, there wasn't a lot of food. Not to mention, in order to get it, you know, you weren't going down to the 7-Eleven. It was, uh, you would have to hunt, you would have to gather, you'd have to put in energy to get energy. And, you know, we know it wasn't always easy to come by. It kind of depended on where you lived, obviously. Um, but recently in the grand scheme of time and space, within the last hundred years, we've been able to produce really an abundance of food. And we've engineered our food to be as delicious as possible. <laughs> And we have so much food now that the average person in America or America as a whole, we throw out about a third of the food that we produce. So we've gone from being these creatures who evolved to 
because food was scarce and hard to find, if you had the opportunity to eat it, maybe eat a little more than you needed at any given time, that would give you a survival advantage because you could store that energy. And then the next time that you can't find food, you're going to survive that. Um, we still have that drive to eat a little more than we need, but we live in a world where food is rarely scarce, right? So it's a evolutionary mismatch, basically. You know, I, I don't know if you heard me talk about the default food environment. We were talking about it a minute ago, effectively in the pantry exam. You know, we were both, you know, talking to each other about the challenges of our pantries. And this is what I kind of talk to my patients about is the default food environment, right? So when you're, um, when you're, changing a habit that requires subtraction to me the strategy is changing the environment when you're changing a habit that requires addition there's a whole different strategy but um the default food environment is as you said it's incredibly palatable incredibly calorie dense uh incredibly non-perishable and therefore portable uh and incredibly cheap so if you just think about dollar per kilojoule it's it, you can't fathom how remarkable this is. And by the way, uh, you know, I don't believe that any of that is particularly nefarious on the part of industry. I think it's solving a problem. Yes. And the solution happened to produce, you know, those those things that we now have that meet those criteria. And it's just that one of the criteria that wasn't on the list, there's not a fifth criteria that is like healthy. Right, like you right. Know, make it such that if you consumed it at any level, it would not harm you. That yeah. that is obviously not one of the criteria. So, um, what do we know about the most contentious topic of them all, which is what is at the root of the obesity crisis? Because while people can debate that, there's really no debate at the state of our excess nutrition. Um, mm -hmm. so, I mean, I'll let you give the stats, but we are an overnourished species at this point, um, that even globally, the state of overnourishment exceeds that of malnourishment. Yeah. So 40 some odd percent of Americans are now obese. That number is expected to climb. Um, <clears throat> and globally too, I believe that diseases that stem from overnourishment <laughs> outweigh those that stem from overnourishment by about by four undernourishment. By fourfold. Yeah. yeah undernourishment. By, yeah. yeah. And so, you know, to your point, this is a good problem to have because literally for all of time, um, your job was getting food every day and preparing it. All right. So a great example is um, before we created production lines to make tortillas, Mexican women used to spend five hours a day hand grinding corn to make tortillas. Right. When we get in um, food production lines and we sort of um, start to process our food more, that frees up a lot of time for people. It makes food more abundant. It makes it easier to come by. It makes it cheaper. So today, I think the average American spends about 8% of their income on food. In the past, we used to spend more than 40%. So that's a... Eight versus 40. Eight versus 40. Wow. So think about that, right? Um, so this is a good problem to have, but we now have so much food that it, be, it does become hard to manage. And, you know, as you've talked about plenty on this podcast, uh, obesity is linked to so many of the diseases now that end up cutting our lives short. And not only that, um, they cut into our health span. Right? They make us immobile, um, and I think that that leads to some downstream consequences like depression, anxiety. And so um, it really is, it becomes pernicious over time. And the, one of the issues is that food will always be rewarding in the short term. Right? It's a hard battle to fight. So I have a lot of empathy for people who um, are obese. You know, um, I understand that it's it's very challenging because we do live in a food environment where you can make that decision for that thing that's going to um, be delicious, feel good in the short term, but it is um, too much of it can cause some long term problems. So when you wanted to look into this question, you did something that I think is very interesting, and folks, when they read the book, I think will be particularly intrigued by this section where you decided to go and live with some hunter gatherers. Now there aren't that many hunter gatherers left 
And usually when we talk about them, we think of the Hadza because so much attention has been sort of thrown their way. But you went to a different group in Bolivia, the mm -hmm. Chimani, correct? Yeah. I, I hadn't even heard of this group of hunter-gatherers until I read the book. So um, how did you find them? How did you select them over some of the ones that could have been a lot easier to reach, uh, again, such as the Hadza? Yeah. So I came across this uh, paper, and I believe it was 2018. And I basically found that this tribe does not get heart disease. So when you look at, you know, what kills the average person, it's heart disease. That's the number one killer of Americans. It's the number one killer worldwide. So I go, okay, it's going down there. What's, let's see what's going on there. Because the other thing that I think is important is when you look at what people actually worry about health-wise, it's not heart disease. Definitely not. It's cancer. <laughs> people worry about cancer. People worry about terrorism. They worry about violence. Right. So you'll have people who stock, you know, tons and tons of guns and bullets because they don't want to get killed. And yet they've also got a pantry full of junk food. And it's like, well, maybe we should think about that, too. <laughs> um, so I read this paper. I talk to the two researchers on it and I decide I'm going to go down there. You know, I want to see it for myself because uh, my background is I'm a journalist and I'm an investigative journalist. So I travel places to meet with people to see what's going on. I get my eyes on on the world. So I fly into La Paz. Go to the source. Go to as, the source. As, as, as one of your editors might have said. Yes, yes. Um, so I fly into La Paz. Um, then we take a 12-hour car ride down to a town called Ronabaque in Bolivia. And from there, we get in a canoe. It's called a Peke Peke boat. So they're these long boats. are like 30 feet, really thin, and they've got these motors on them. They're called long tail motor. We take that about uh, six hours up a feeder river of the Amazon. And it was hilarious because, you know, all you can see is jungle the entire time. Like it's all green. It all looks the same. And then the, the boat driver just, you know, eventually pulls over and you're going, how, how did he know? How did you know? You know, and he's like, this is it. Get out, you know? Um, yeah. And there they were. And they're fascinating, I think, because they're not true hunter gatherers. They do a lot of, um, so they're hunter horticulturalists, I guess you right. would consider them. So... <clears throat> What was interesting with them is that, you know, at some point in a given day, because you sort of brought up how we've had all these fad diets over the last X amount of years, at some point in a the day, they're going to offend some fad diet, right? So they eat meat, uh, they eat plain white rice, their diet isn't necessarily low fat, it's not necessarily low carb. Um, they're eating things like corn, right? That's off limits in so many diet books. But the commonality behind their food is that it all has one ingredient. So they're basically not getting access to ultra processed food. And um, that seems to be one of the key reasons they've been able to avoid disease. I mean, they're and, not. And tell me about the population. So how many folks are there? Yeah. So I believe there are 20,000. That might be a high number. Um, might be five, five to 20,000 spread throughout the Amazon, um, the Bolivian Amazon. But the tribe, the group that I went and saw, there's about 50 of them in a small village. And what does the distribution of their lifespan look like? Uh, in other words, um, what is median survival? Because I imagine there's a skew down on median based on no access to antibiotics and the things that we take for granted here where what i call medicine 2.0 has done a remarkable job of extending human lifespan right so when i asked um i had a guide who was from another tribe take me up there and i said all right great they don't you know they don't die of heart disease they don't die of alzheimer's what do they die of and he just goes, oh, accidents. It's accidents. It's uh, snakes. Like literally there's snakes out there that if you get bit, you're, you're screwed. Um, I think they live into their 70s on average if, if they're managed to sidestep a, you know, a snake or some other accident. And then the claim that they don't have coronary artery disease, explain how that, how that claim has been uh, validated. Yeah, so they um, put them in a boat, this guy that I talked to, this researcher. They got a bunch of the tribe members, and they took them into the village to do uh, CT scans of their heart. And so they basically didn't have a lot of the markers that they look for in that scan. Yeah, so they're doing these CT angiograms on folks in their 70s. And I believe, as you described it, they looked like healthy 50 year olds is that about yeah. the, the time yeah phase? i believe it was, was about they looked uh their hearts looked about 30 years younger 30 years yes. younger. okay 
So we've got these folks and they, at least on the basis of what I refer to as the four horsemen, they don't seem to get the four horsemen and eventually they're going to die because of these other problems. Um, there are a lot of things that are different for them, right? So one could say, well, they're probably not under chronic stress. They're probably quite active. They probably have a really good circadian rhythm and sleep well, and they don't have electronics. And obviously they eat a very different diet. How much do you think this different diet, which I want you to go into a little more detail on because you even attempted to follow it for some time. How much do you think the diet played a role in this, given that we can't answer that question prospectively. Yeah, I think it plays a pretty large factor. Of course, it's not everything. Now, one of the reasons I think this is because there is another tribe called the Mozatan, who I spend a little bit of time with. They're only an hour from the village. So they will go into town, they'll get ultra processed food, they'll get things like oil, and they will fry their plantains, right? The, the chamane are baking them in a fire. They're just not um, doing all these things that make the food a lot more appealing and in turn lead them to overeat. Um, the Mosaten seem to have uh, elevated risk of heart disease, according to the scientists I talked to. So let's go back to what these folks eat. W w go through what the Chimani eat, because <clears throat> you describe it as they're eating tons of meat, they're eating tons of carbs, they're eating tons of plants. As you said, they're kind of violating every cult of diet out there. Yeah, they, they absolutely are. So I would say in the average uh, day, so for breakfast, it's probably something like white rice, maybe some plantains with some protein. It could be fish. It could be chicken. It could be um, they hunt a Amazonian deer called a taper. So that's a red meat. For lunch, very similar, pile of white rice, maybe some fish, a little bit of vegetables. So one thing that was interesting too is that they're not eating a ton of vegetables. Right. So if, if you and I go to, you know, sweet greens salad chain or whatever, like that single salad that we would get there is probably the amount of vegetables we're eating across the day in the way we think of vegetables, like greens, cabbage, things like that. And then for dinner, it's the same deal. It's more carbs, it's sweet potatoes, it's maybe some meat, it's uh, fish, and it's just very simple uh, foods repeated over and over and over. And that's, I think, what it was probably like for humans for most of time. You know, one of the fascinating things about today is that we have more options for food to eat than ever before. I mean, think of your average grocery store. It's got like 10,000 things that you can choose from, right? But, uh, and that is very new in the grand scheme of time and space. And I think that uh, we haven't necessarily learned to navigate that well. So we do know that the more options people have to eat, the more things they can eat, the more that person will eat. So this is a term, the buffet effect. You've alluded to there's um, a real raging debate within the obesity community where so many interesting theories are put forth. Um, and it might be that no one theory is wholly complete. So obviously one theory is food availability. It's simply the quantity of food that is available. Um, and there are certainly examples of where that seems to work, but then there are other counterexamples where you can find in places of either high or low food availability, you get the opposite to what you would expect based on the theory. You talk about palatability. F food today is hyper palatable. And again, there are plenty of examples, this being one of them where hyper palatability or lack thereof seems to play a role. Obviously you then get into its carbs, its fats, it's this, it's that, it's the other thing. Um, where do you think pleasure from eating fits into this landscape? In other words, anybody listening to this takes for granted, I think, uh, we all take for granted the idea that like eating is often very pleasurable because we have choice. Like, I don't know, I'm going to decide what I'm going to eat today. If I'm at a buffet or even if I'm at home or if I'm at a restaurant ordering something, I'm going to presumably order something that I enjoy eating. Do you get the sense that they enjoy eating? I couldn't tell you that, to be honest. I will tell you that as someone coming from, here's how I want to answer that actually. As someone coming from the US and Las Vegas, by the way, which buffets everywhere, um, their food was not enjoyable. It's very, very, very plain. They're not salting it. You're eating plantains that have been baked in a fire. The fish is just, you know, they cook it up and it is what it is. Yeah, what is it? I, I, I've never consumed fish without at least putting salt on it. What does it 
taste like it's just like flaky it's just flaky unsalted fish yeah interesting and the chicken as well one thing that was fascinating is that their chickens are also um much different than ours because i bet our chickens have been bred to be giant right like they, yeah. they could never live out in the wild the chickens that we have in the big um, plants in the u.s their chickens are wild chickens they weigh like three pounds and there's not much meat on them and the meat that is on them it's, it's very be tough it's very tough it's very stringy i mean you, you know i took a bite of it. i'm like oh yeah we're we're not in las vegas anymore <laughs> <laughs> And, um, yeah, it's, it, I mean, it's not that, uh, enjoyable comparatively. So food is, so eating is a, is a, is a, is a thing you do because you need to do it. Yes. You, you do it because you need to do it. Now at the same time, you know, I, I know that they're not having access to Las Vegas buffet. So for them, is it like, oh, this is pretty good. Like that could very well be. How long did it take, if at all, for your taste buds to downregulate and for you to be like, you know, I can actually taste the sweetness in this plantain. And these sweet potatoes really are kind of a, a step up in sweetness from the plain rice or whatever. Like, did, did you did you go through this desensitization or rather a resensitization as you stayed with them? Yeah, I think so. I think you start to enjoy it more. And it could just be that you're hungry now. Right. You've come from you've come from the city where you've had all this great food and now you're shoveled into this to this world and your first meal is you're going, OK, I'm just going to have a little bit of this because it doesn't taste good. And then all of a sudden, you know, you do that for a few days. And you go, OK, well, I'm actually hungry now. I got to eat. And uh, I do feel like hunger is the best sauce. Right. If you're hungry, a lot can taste good. If you're deprived of something and then you get it, it becomes more enjoyable. What about um, any of the, so, so here in the U.S., of course, or in the developed world, any one of us, myself included, who's thinking about their weight is kind of playing this game of how much should I eat? And, you know, there are all these great, you know, sort of models like, well, you know, always get up from the table when you're still a little bit hungry or really, you know, try, you know, count your calories or limit your carbs or limit your fat or, you know, whatever. we always have like kind of heuristics that we try to use to regulate caloric balance. Do they do any such thing or do they literally eat as much as they want of these bland foods, but their off switch just comes so much sooner because presumably nothing in their brain is being hijacked? Yeah. So there, I'll answer that with this. There was an interesting study from Kevin Hall at the NIH and they basically took a group of people and for two weeks, um, they fed them a diet that was ultra processed food. Uh, I love this study, by the way. Oh, it's fantastic. It's so, so, so great. Kevin Hall's great. And Kevin was a real skeptic going into this study. I think it's worth maybe that's, giving a little bit of background. That's a great point. So yeah. a group from Brazil had basically come out and said that you know, one of the reasons uh, for the obesity crisis is because of uh, the food is ultra processed. They're, the nature of the ultra processing itself is leading people to eat more. So he calls them up and he goes, you know, what evidence do you have? Like, why do you think that? And sorry to interrupt, but just to make sure the listener understands, because you and I know Kevin very well. Um, Kevin's an empiricist whose view is to the best of his knowledge based on his data. And Kevin generally has access to the most controlled studies because he runs a metabolic ward. Right. It's the energy content of the food that is driving weight gain. Yes. And it is independent of the quality of the food. Yes. So a thousand calories of broccoli is as fattening as a thousand calories of potato chips. Yes. So he calls them up and he, you know, he says basically that. And he goes, So why do you think that? And they go, well, ultra processed food has more, it's got more sugar, it's got more salt. And he goes, well, you just named all these macronutrients. Like you can't say that. And that doesn't make any sense. So what he decides to do is he's going to study this, see if there's any there, there, because he's a skeptic, right? So it takes this group of people, uh, for two weeks, they eat a, uh, they were kind of differentiated, but for the first two weeks, they eat a ultra processed diet. For the next two weeks, they eat a diet that is matched for everything, carbs, salt, all that, uh, for the other two weeks. But this food is minimally processed. So it's a minimally processed version of the diet. So for example, 
on one night of the ultra processed diet, you might be getting, you know, like the Swanson meatloaf with the, with the, uh, mashed potatoes that have the butter and all that kind of stuff. Uh, on the unprocessed night, that version might be cut of beef, you know, some plain potatoes, that sort of thing. And what he finds is that when and, and just to be clear, I believe you could it was an ad lib feed study. Yes, you the the participant eats as much of the, the food as they want. Yes, they're not being restricted. Correct. So he's telling them eat as much as you want until you feel full. And what he finds is that when people are on the uh, ultra processed diet, they end up eating about five hundred more calories a day, and they start to gain weight. When they are on the minimally processed diet, they eat less and they start to spontaneously lose weight. And so I think one of the reasons for this, uh, obviously there's a lot of potential reasons, but I think one of the things that he thinks is that uh, speed becomes a factor. So when you process a food to the extent that it becomes you know, an ultra processed food, i.e. a junk food, uh, it becomes a lot faster to eat and you simply uh, end up eating more of it and there's more triggers to continue eating more of it because it is so hyper palatable and enjoyable. This leads to the three V's of snacking. Yes. Right. So I talked to a, uh, a guy who's with the food industry and he says, if you want to get a snack food to sell, it's got to have three V's. It's got to have value. So it's got to be relatively affordable. It's got to have variety meaning there's got to be a variety of flavors. The flavors have to be intense. And oh, by the way, if you're making one, just one snack food, that's not a good, that's not a good idea. Don't make just one original Pringles, make 20 Pringles, make barbecue Pringles, make sour cream pr Pringles, on and on and on, right? There's all this different varieties. And then uh, three, the third V is velocity. It has to be fast to eat. So snacking was not a sort of cultural thing until about 1970. And once people start to really snack, I mean, this becomes, this is a concerted movement by the food industry to go, okay, uh, how do we sell more food? Right? Well, let's invent this category called snacking. And once you see <laughs> snacking start to take off, I think you really start to see the rise in obesity in our country and then to have it trickle out across the world in 1970. Yeah, it's kind of amazing to think that only 50 years ago, this concept, which seems so ingrained in how we live, I mean, you can't really go anywhere. Like think about every time you're on an airplane, there's like a snack basket, like everywhere you go, there are snacks. There are snacks. Yeah. And so, uh, and there's a, I think there's a lesson in that, right? And so it, when you think about, okay, well, if I'm trying to eat less, how can I do that? Well, I think that the lessons from the Chimane suggest, and there's other research that back this, backs this up, is that foods that are minimally processed, easy way to think about that is are ingredients rather than have ingredients. Um, they cut the breaks that sort of lead people to overeat, meaning it's a lot slower to eat uh, foods that are unprocessed. So let's go back to your, uh, the example of the, you know, thousand calories of brownie versus a thousand calories of broccoli. Yes. Those two things might make you equally fat, but I would love to watch a person try and eat 1000 calories of broccoli. It's exactly. never going to happen. It just takes up so much volume in your stomach. It's slow to eat. Whereas with a brownie, I mean, I've eaten a thousand calories of brownie before. Right. I mean, it's, it's relatively easy to do and there's, I could do it right and now. It's if enjoyable. Like. Uh, we can do it after this podcast. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, no. I, 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 um, you know, I get asked all the time about the carnivore diet, right? And, and people sort of say, what do you, what do you think of this? Does this really work? And I said, look, uh, as someone who's never done it, but who thinks about this problem a lot, it doesn't really surprise me that if a person were limited to ribeyes, and they couldn't eat a single other thing but ribeyes, despite how calorically dense a ribeye is, and it's right at the top of calorically dense foods, yeah, I can totally see how a person would lose weight. Now, if you said, well, it's ribeyes plus baked potatoes, plus you know this, plus this, plus this, and that's all I'm gonna eat, well, at some point it becomes a little bit comical. So, um, yeah, like I think if you were stuck eating one food for the rest of your life, you would wither away, regardless of what that food is. And by the way, that might even apply to something as ridiculous as ice cream. Um, and uh, conversely, 
If you want to make that even more extreme, if you want to increase the number of food choices, you have to pull a different knob or dial a different lever the other way, which is, okay, then you have to dial down the processing. Right. Yeah, um, exactly. So, so, so you, so, I mean, I just love this story. And then you go home and you decide you're going to give this a shot. It's like the diet with no name. Yeah. So I hang out with uh, this tribe for a while, learn from them, observe what they're eating, fish with them, just hang out. Great people. Go back to uh, Las Vegas and I decide, uh, okay, I'm going to try this for a month. I'm going to see what happens. So literally it's every food that I eat has to have just one ingredient. I got to mimic as closely as I can what they're eating. So what? Does, tell me this, when you go home, how many foods in your pantry and refrigerator already fit that description? Oh, there, there's like eight foods in the pantry that probably has 200 items that fit this. Right? Okay. I've got like some apples in so there. So your pantry's as bad as mine. Uh, yeah, I've got some plain rice. I've got, you know, but even things that I think people would normally maybe consider healthy, like whole wheat bread, flip that over. It's like, wow, that's a long list of stuff. Um, so I end up going to Costco to try and solve for this problem. And I'm walking the aisles and there's literally entire aisles that are just off limits, right? So you're left with a very basic diet every single day. In the morning, I might eat something like oatmeal. I might eat uh, some eggs with that. At lunch, I might air fry some plantains and have um, some fish. At dinner, uh, I would have maybe a sweet potato with some green beans. And um, you know, luckily, we both hunt uh, with some elk. And I will tell you, it was not as exciting as my normal diet. At the same time, I started dumping weight pretty fast. And I didn't necessarily want to lose weight. So I all of a sudden had to go, okay, if I want to stay at, it was 180 pounds about, if I want to stay, you know, at least at 175, I'm going to have to up my caloric intake. Oh my gosh. It became so much food. Right? You, you were force feeding yourself. I was force feeding myself. Yes. So one day, for example, I'm like, okay, I'm trying to do some rough math in my head of, you know, calories. I'm going, okay, we're going to need X amount of plantains get them there. And it's just, it's a mountain, you know, and, uh, it becomes tough to eat all that food. So, so by the way, did you restrict yourself in any other way? Did you not snack deliberately? Like if you, or were you just never hungry between meals? If I wanted a snack, I would usually just have a piece of fruit. So there, you know, the jungle out there is filled with fruit. I will say that was the one food they had that was good. So they had pretty oh, good bet. fruit out there. Yeah, it was fantastic. Um, so I gotta say, Michael, like that doesn't sound like an impossible to follow diet if you have control of your food environment. Where I think a diet like that becomes challenging is the moment you venture out of your own preparation bubble, i.e. the moment you go to someone's house for dinner or the moment you go to a restaurant. So how did you navigate those situations? Yeah, that was that was absolutely challenging. Um, the reality is, is I couldn't be perfect then, right? If my neighbor invites me over and says, hey, we're making you dinner, I'm not going to walk in and be like, Okay, well, I got this food list from this. <laughs> You're not going to be that guy. This tribe in the Amazon, please. Yeah, just, uh, you know, <laughs> fry me up some plantains. Air fry, though. Only air fry. Um, so I wasn't going to do that. So I would just kind of do the best I could. You know, if it's a cookout, they're going to have like some grilled chicken. They might have some, I don't know, like potatoes or something. I would just do my best. And do you have a sense of what your macros broke down into? Heavier on the carbs. So these people. Like what, what were you, roughly 50 would, carbs? Yeah, more than 50% carbs. Okay. I would say 50 to, 50 to 60 at least. Yeah, could have been up into the 70s and some days. And what else did you have for protein besides fish? Elk. Oh, that's right. Eggs. You mentioned elk. But yeah. when you would you season the elk? Uh, sometimes, I, I'm not going to lie, sometimes I would put some salt on that, Peter. <laughs> and, and do you think that that's violating? A, I mean, again, we're, there's no principle here yeah. we're trying to adhere to. But do you think that that changed your appetitive behavior because that's effectively what we're trying to get oh, it makes at it, it makes it easier to eat yeah and if something's easier to eat you're gonna eat more of it so now apply that to you know how much we how much protein were you food. able to eat per day because that's i mean the eggs would be a good way to get protein but i mean as much as i love meat i really like to have salt and pepper on it yeah well i think that sometimes we discount how much protein comes from grains yeah. depending on what the grain That's is true. and we often discount that so if i'm having a giant bowl of oatmeal in the morning i mean that might have 18 20 grams right there and so that starts to but you won't you can't in. mix it with anything you're not going to put even you wouldn't even put berries on the oatmeal i would sometimes put berries on the okay, oatmeal. so that doesn't yeah. violate the rule yeah no we're we all got one ingredient here so i see so it's all single ingredients all that can be mixed together yeah yeah exactly yeah. okay um 
So again, I, I, I kind of want to try this. Oh, you should try it, dude. I guarantee. Uh, uh, one thing that was interesting is I followed up with a buddy whose name is um, Trevor Cashy. Oh, yeah. He, you wrote about Trevor in the first book. Yeah. He's yeah. in The Comfort Crisis. Brilliant guy. He's a uh, biochemist and he ended up getting into nutrition. And, you know, I said, I told him about what was happening and he said, um, basically a lot of good things can happen too that even if you have a very low level allergy to a food that you're not aware of by cutting out um a lot of the foods i did it could be too that you know maybe i was uh, to some extent allergic to a food and i wasn't aware of it and that helped me you know lose weight or might have made me end up feeling better or something like that so i think that there's a lot of things um a lot of good things that can come out of a project like that and the reality is is like would i tell anyone to eat that exact way the rest of their life and never violate that no do i think that something like that is worth trying so you can learn okay these are some foods that seem to work for me i i tend to feel more full on fewer calories when i'm eating foods like this and then from there you can go, okay, like I have a general plan that's going to be like, I'm going to eat like this 80, 90% of the time, whatever it might be. Uh, and then, you know, we do live in a world where it's amazing in the sense that you can, we can sit down and have that thousand calories of brownies, right? If I bring a thousand calories of brownies to the Jumane, they're going to be like, oh my God, this is amazing. They're going to eat it, right? And so I'm not saying that we should never eat ultra processed food. I think the the question is, how do we manage that, right? Because we do live in a world where it's incredible that we can have brownies, that we can have 15 different flavors of Doritos. It's all great. But if we are eating those foods too often, all the time, that becomes the brunt of our diet. I mean, we know we're going to have issues. And I think that, um, I, I believe a lot of the research suggests that anywhere from 60 to 70% of American diet is ultra processed. So you start to look at that and go, okay, we've got snacking, we've got people eating ultra processed food for most of the foods they're eating. And I think it starts to make sense why you see scales start to get higher over time. Do you have a sense of why some people are more or less immune to those effects? Um, there are some people who even when presented with ultra processed food don't eat to excess. And yet there are others, and I would put myself far on this scale, where it's the only way I'm not going to eat to excess in the, in the, um, in the setting of hyper palatable, hyper processed food is enormous self-discipline when I can manage to exert it, which is not always, and probably not all, not most of the time. In other words, I have to use hacks and tricks to get around it. Whereas I know people who can sit in front of a plate of freshly made cookies and eat one yeah. while the entire plate sits there in front of them for the next hour. Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. Um, I don't think there's a perfect answer. I do think sometimes food can be used for things other than nutrition. For example, stress relief, things like that. Um, emotions, dealing with emotions. I, I do think you tend to see, um, especially today, um, people eat for emotional reasons, right? There was a study that I had in the comfort crisis that uh, suggested that 80% of eating today is driven by reasons other than true hunger. And so there's a lot of, a lot of things it could be, it's a certain time of day, but I think, uh, or, you know, food is around, so you just eat it. But I do think that stress eating is a thing that works. Like eating food will solve your stress in the short and, term. And where do you think that comes you? from in the sense that, cause let's go, I want to talk about the scarcity loop. We haven't defined mm -hmm. it. I, I sort of jumped into it, but we're going to talk about what the scarcity loop is, but there are some people like I could walk into a casino, which we're going to talk about gambling. It wouldn't even occur to me to play a slot machine. Like it wouldn't, the thought wouldn't cross my mind. I would just look at that and think, why would I ever want to waste a dollar? Like it, I, and I, I say that not with any judgment on those who have destroyed their lives at slot machines, but that doesn't, I mean, I don't like, I would, if you said to me, you could play the slot machine or watch the paint dry on the wall. I'd be like, well, at least I don't have to pay to watch the paint dry. <laughs> um, so, so there are, but yet there are some addictions such as food that I will struggle with indefinitely. Um, and we could go through the list. There are some people who, you know, drugs, you know, whether it be that first time they take a painkiller, it puts a hook into them that is very difficult for them to escape. Alcohol, same thing. Like, never occurs to me to get drunk. And I know, obviously, you're sober. So right. clearly, for you, alcohol scratched an itch. 
that it's never scratched for me and I feel very grateful for that. In other words, I don't think there's a moral difference between us. I think there's like a biochemical difference. Mm -hmm. Do you have a sense of why each of us have different vulnerabilities when it comes to the scarcity loop? That's a great question. I think, um, I don't know if that, I mean, you might know, but I don't think there's a very specific answer. Like, why do people, why do you like F1 and I like basketball, right? It's, who knows? But I do think that probably exposure um, during vulnerable periods sort of sets the table. So for example, um, here's, a, here's a good example from addiction research. If a uh, person drinks at 15 or younger, they have a coin flips chance of becoming an alcoholic. If they drink uh, after 21, 21 or older, they have a 10% chance. And so why is that? It's because your brain is developing such a way from the from puberty till you're about 25 where you're trying to figure out, okay, how do I find comfort? How do I navigate the world? How do I deal with stress? How do I deal with my problems? And so I think that that sort of gets set in with alcohol, for example, that gets set in at that age and you go, oh, this thing, this is what works for me, right? So it could be maybe at a young age, like food works for you to help you deal, your, deal with your problems. For me, it was like, you know, I... First time I drank when I was like 15, I'm like, wow, the world's way better after this, right? It was like a very deep learning experience. That's so interesting. I remember reading that and thinking of my first time drinking, which was 13, but I drank so much. It was funny. I worked at my dad's restaurant. It was New Year's Eve. I was a busboy. And at the end of the night, I went around and drank all of the remaining drinks on the table oh, no. of everything that was there, including... This is back when you could even have a can of beer and I'm pouring it out and like cigarette butts are coming out and I'm drinking the beer. Like, and I got so drunk that not only did I vomit throughout the night, I was drunk the next day. Oh, wow. Is it just the case that that was such an unpleasant experience versus, you know, your experience? And by the way, you know, recently Matthew Perry died and I remember reading an article about him where he talked about the first time he drank and... I think he said, you know, he sort of drank a bottle of wine, laid in a field and was like, this is the greatest feeling in the world. So uh, that made me think that maybe it comes down to not just age of exposure, but the reward that comes from that yeah. exposure. And maybe, you know, if there if there's no reward and in fact, there's a punishment physiologically, it could have the opposite effect. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think y y you learn that this thing is good, right? You do this thing. Oh, that was a good outcome. I'm going to do that again because I mm -hmm. want that good thing again. Whereas yeah. with you, your exposure to alcohol was, okay, I did this thing. Wow, that was terrible. <laughs> I'm not going to do that again, right? It's for you. It's like putting your hand on the stove. Yeah. So, oof, not doing that ever again. For me, it was like I flipped on the stove and this amazing five course best meal of my life appeared. And it was like, wow, I'm going to be touching that stove button to get that to happen again. So I think it's, it's very much just a learned behavior that we, I mean, that's how humans, humans learn. That's why we do what we do because we get rewarded for it. Right. And so I think it, um, just sort of gets set in particularly at a, at a young age and, um, you know, and it could be that by the time going back to that study, by the time you're 21, well, you figured out these other ways to navigate the world, what you get rewards from. And so if you've waited until 21, you're like, well, I have all these other things that give me rewards. Yeah. And, you, you've, you've figured out other self-soothing tools. Yeah. That, yeah. So let's now talk about the scarcity loop. There are three components to it and these three components get exploited in our lives everywhere we go. Yeah. What, what are they and how do they feed off each other? Yeah. I mean, so for context, the reason that I started thinking about this is that I live in Las Vegas and in Vegas, I mean, you talked about your experience with slot machines. Well, not everyone in Vegas feels the way you do about no, slot and, machines. And I, and I, and I, and I <laughs> again, I don't say that with any judgment or moral superiority. I truly believe there's a biological difference yeah. between me and that person in Vegas who could throw their life away. Yeah, totally. I agree. So I basically make the observation that one, you have to realize that slot machines are all over Las Vegas. They're in the grocery stores, they're in the gas stations, they're in uh, the restaurants, the bars, they're in the airport. And people play them all the time. And so when I go down to the gas station to, you know, fill up my truck and, and get a Diet Coke, I'll see people in there at, you know, 7 a.m. playing the slot machine. And I see that and I go, why would anyone do that? Like, it doesn't make any sense because everyone knows the house always wins. And by the way, 
when the house wins in blackjack and poker, it's only slightly, right? It's like, you know, it's 51-49, right? What is the, how, how much does the house win in slot machines? So it's actually not super, super far off of those odds. So in oh, the okay. past, slot machines used to be, they call them one-armed bandits because the case was that they were one-armed bandits. Now I believe that uh, slot machines are about, return about 85 cents for every dollar you spend Got on it. average. So, um, so I see this. Which and, is smart for reasons you're going to explain. Yeah, we'll, we'll, get, in, we'll yep. get into why that works and why once they shifted from not giving people frequent wins and rewards to more frequent wins and rewards, why slot machines took off. So I make this observation about slot machines and I start wondering, okay, how does a slot machine work? How can this thing get people to be down at the 7-Eleven and sit for hours and hours and play this thing where you, you know you're going to lose? Play it long enough, you're going to lose. That's just how it works. So I go into journalist mode and what was fascinating is it's the first people that I call are people who are, I would guess I would term them, um, they're gambling researchers, but they have a very anti-gambling bent. Okay. So they're looking at, okay, here's all the reasons why gambling hurts us. Here's why people get hooked on slot machines. And I call them up and I talk to these people and they tell me all sorts of things that, um, kind of like the myths you hear about casinos, right? So uh, one person said, uh, slot machines only play in the key of C. And the key of C is very pleasing to people and it uh, relaxes their wallet, you know, relaxes them and in turn their wallets. Another person tells me, oh, casinos don't use right angles because right angles activate the decision-making part of your brain and that'll slow down your rate of gambling, all these different things. Another one was casinos don't have clocks, so you lose track of time. Did you hear the one about how casinos inject oxygen into the air to, I, I don't know why that would make you want to gamble more, but I remember hearing that they're pumping oxygen into the room. Also known as the biggest fire hazard ever known to man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so I go, okay, like, sounds good. But the problem is, is I live in Las Vegas and I got a casino like two X's for me. So I go into the casino. Uh, no, they don't have clocks, but like neither does Costco, neither does Walmart. Neither does any normal business. They, we, we don't just hang clocks everywhere. I don't have one in here, by the way. I don't know if you noticed. Right. Well, you're no. trying to manip manipulate me somehow. I, I am <laughs> trying to get you to play a slot machine. Uh, the right angles thing. Slot machine screens are a square. That is right angles, right? And then I call up a uh, slot machine audio composer who lives in Vegas. It's a real job you can have in that town. And uh, he goes, where did you hear that? I use all keys. You know, I'm just trying to make the best little jingle that I can. I'm just <laughs> trying to have fun. Um, so I realized that my inherent problem is that I am talking to people who want us all to stop gambling and I need to talk to the people who want us to start gambling, right? I got to follow the money on this thing. So long story short is through, um, some different contacts. I end up at this place on the edge of town in Vegas and it's this new cutting edge casino. Um, but it is not fully open to the public like a normal casino would be. It is used, uh, it's a casino laboratory. So it's used entirely for research on human behavior. <laughs> and the people invested in this are gambling companies. So big gambling companies um, like Boyd, Caesars, whatever, all the big names, um, but also a lot of tech companies. So there's 73 different companies that are invested in this place. And it is it, it is very much like a twilight zone of casinos. You walk into this place and you're like, I'm in, I'm in a casino, but there's a lot of people with PhDs and there's, you know, they're doing studies and... Uh, I end up talking to a guy who designs slot machines and he basically explains like, oh yeah, here's how a slot machine works. And he lays out this system and I talk to other people who talk about it in different ways. So I call it the scarcity loop. And so the reason a slot machine works is it works on this three-part system that I call the scarcity loop. So part one, or the first condition is opportunity. You have an opportunity to get something of value. So in the case of a slot machine, it's, it's money, right? Uh, part two is unpredictable rewards. You know, you're going to get the thing of value at some point, but you don't know when, and you don't know how valuable it's going to be. So with the slot machine, once you play a game and those reels are rolling, they could all land and you get nothing. They could land and you win say $2 on your dollar bet, or you could win $20,000 on your dollar bet. There's a crazy range of outcomes every single game. And then three, and this is important is quick repeatability. So once those reels land, you can immediately repeat the behavior. You can play again. So the average slot machine player plays 16 games a minute, which is more than we blink. Now, the reason that this is uh, 
important to talk about that we're not just talking about slot machines here, right? This isn't a gambling podcast, is that uh, this system can get people to do a lot of other behaviors that are seemingly irrational too. So it's, uh, it's what makes a lot of different systems like social media work, right? You post something, you got an opportunity to get some likes, some status. So you check and recheck because you don't know when those likes are coming in. You don't know if your post is going to go viral. You might get canceled. <laughs> you might get a message from someone that you think is great on and on and on, right? Um, it's in dating apps. It's in different financial apps. So one of the reasons that uh, Robinhood really took off is because they increased the quick repeatability by removing fees for trades. Uh, it's in online shopping. A lot of uh, advertisers are using casino-like features in their ads to sort of drive profits. And that's uh, led to a seven-fold increase in conversion rates when they put like a spinning wheel for a discount. And so I think when you start to look at the behaviors that people have a hard time moderating, I think a lot of them rely on this system. Let's talk a little bit more about... Um how one can use that information to break the cycle. Um, let's talk about drug use, right? So you, you chose a very interesting place to go to investigate drug use. I was very surprised by that, given the problems we have here in the US. You could have literally gone to any city in the US. I'm not sure why you had to go into Baghdad. The reason that I went into Baghdad is because um, you had nothing and now you have something. And it really stands for what I think uh, the conditions that you need for a addiction uh, epidemic to rise. So to give some context, um, for most of the time, Iraq didn't have a drug problem. And a lot of that was for political reasons. Saddam ruled with kind of an iron fist around that. And then the US invades and it destabilizes the country, right? So you have a big population that has lived through a war. And then soon after Syria falls, Syria becomes a narco state effectively, and they start producing a drug that is called Captagon, and it's analogous to methamphetamine. And so they start sending this drug all throughout the Middle East. So you've got three things. You got one, you have a population who is in a lot of pain. Uh, you have few ways to deal with that pain that are more productive, not a lot of options. And then three, you have a substance that solves that pain that problem in the short term immediately. And so I think that um, leads to that rise in addiction. And you, I think you see it here in the US as well. It's like, why did the opioid epidemic start in states where the factories had moved out? Well, it's because factories move out, our lives change, we don't have a lot of resources, things have gotten really dark. And now we have this flood of pills that can take away those problems in the short term, that can allow us to escape from that life we live. But I think um, the reason for going to Iraq instead of a place in the US is simply that this is happening now on the ground and it is just booming and it, and it is a new substance. There are kind of two models for drug addiction. Um, what, what are those two models? So there's the uh, sort of moral failing model. So we've thought about it two different ways, uh, that it's a moral failing, i.e. a drug user, an addict is a bad person. They're making this, you know, very specific choice to just mess over other people and putting themselves ahead of, of everyone else. Or, or me, even an extension of that is they simply don't have the self-management, self-discipline. So even if they're not deliberately doing this to sabotage their life, they're, they're, they're so lacking in moral character that yes. they can't manage themselves. Yeah. And then the second is the brain disease model, that um, addiction is the result of a brain disease. Effectively, drugs change your brain in such a way that um, removes your capacity to make any decisions around the behavior, and that drug uh, addiction is a chronic and relapsing disease. Let's talk about a counterexample to both of those. Um, what... What do we know about Vietnam vets' use of heroin when they were in Vietnam versus when they returned? And, and how, how, what, what, does that, what does that tell us? Yeah, so in the Vietnam War, you had about 20 to 25% of soldiers, U.S. soldiers who were in Vietnam were addicted to heroin. They were regular, frequent users of heroin. And President Nixon, 
He decides, I don't want to let all these heroin addicts back into the United States. It was a significant number of people. So he decides to start a program that is called Operation Golden Flow. And the deal is this. If you want to come back into the United States as a soldier who's been in Vietnam, you have to produce a clean urine test. If you do not produce a clean urine test, you will be left in Vietnam. So if addiction basically uh, obliterates the capacity to make any choices, any decisions, you would expect that 25% of the soldiers in Vietnam would be left in Vietnam. Now, what actually happened is that nearly every single one provided clean urine. And when they got back into the United States, the vast majority of them, about 95%, managed to stay clean. The 5% that relapsed, they tended to be people who had used drugs before the war. So this suggests uh, that people aren't necessarily a slave to chemicals, right? That maybe it's a little bit more nuanced than it being purely a brain disease where choice is completely obliterated. How can we extrapolate from that to where we are today? In other words, we're sitting in the midst of an unbelievable epidemic. I've even done a podcast on this and it's a little outside of, you know, my area of expertise. And you could argue, and I have argued that it does impact longevity because uh, mortality rates uh, for the U.S. population are actually in a small state of decline, being driven almost exclusively by the death of people aged roughly 25 to 55, where we've seen the deaths of despair uh, increase at a rate we've never seen before. So deaths of despair are now, um, and, and the biggest of the three deaths of despair, so we count accidental overdose or, you know, that, that includes poisoning, right? So fentanyl in a drug that you don't think has fentanyl, um, alcohol related deaths and suicides. So those three are collectively expanding, but the greatest of the three by far is the overdose, the non-suicide overdose. So <clears throat> what do you, what do you think explains that? Uh, how much of each of the relative contributions do you think are contributing to that? Because it's no longer just, in the old steel mill town, you know, which I think probably explained the thin edge of the wedge in the late 90s and early 2000s. But here we are 25 years later, and this is an epidemic in any and every city, including my city of Austin. Yeah, I think if you're looking at it um, purely from a death st statistics, um, that goes back to fentanyl and that fentanyl is being put in um, drugs that are all over the country now and people aren't necessarily aware that they're getting right. a drug, right? So I, I think we also have to back up and go, okay, well, why do people, why do people use drugs? Why would people use a drug knowing that there's a risk that, that there's fentanyl in something that they weren't expecting fentanyl to be in? Right. I think when you look at drugs from a historical perspective, um, humans have always used psychoactive substances as tools to accomplish something. So if you think about uh, chewing coca leaf in South America, right, the coca leaf was used to enhance focus on long hunts to uh, kill hunger on long hunts when you couldn't find food. Same with tobacco. Um, and so you tend to see that substances have always been used as a tool to accomplish something, right? Because they benefited the person's life somehow. Now, what has changed between today and, you know, 100,000 years ago is that we have made, uh, we've taken our substances and we have distilled them into something where the psychoactive component is so strong and pure that it really can become almost an obliterant in a way, right? And, um, over time, the availability has risen as well. So I think when you think about something like fentanyl being placed into things is, I think there's a lot of people that can use drugs and be okay. Would I recommend that? No. But can people use drugs um, recreationally? I think there are plenty of people who can and do. Um, the work of Carl Hart, for example, gets into this a lot. Um, and so what happens when you start getting fentanyl in drugs that people who are using it recreationally get, um, you start to see people who die. So there's recently in New York City, there was a uh, bad batch of uh, cocaine that had fentanyl in it, and you had five people die in Manhattan in a single night. And these are not people living on the street. 
right? right? These are like people who have an apartment. In these Midtown. are white collar people who yeah. use cocaine recreationally. Yeah, yep. exactly. And so I think that that really accounts for the rise in uh, overdose deaths. So in other words, you you're you're not necessarily thinking that we're seeing an increase in the epidemic of I don't know how to describe it, but like catastrophic drug use or drug use that is commensurate with no function in life outside of drug use. I think we very well might be because uh, the substances, when I'm talking about, uh, you know, deaths being spread around the country, yeah. I think that accounts for that. But I do think that our substances today are strong enough that they can have more extreme consequences. Yeah, yeah. in other know? words, the deaths of despair might be overcounting because some of those people dying might not be in addicted the same to drugs. Yeah, that said, a pushback to that would be, look, should anybody really be using cocaine? Like, right. what does it say about us if we need to be using cocaine? Yeah. Is there some, is there a, you know, like, let's go back to the example you gave. Um, we clearly evolved to enjoy the rush of norepinephrine, right? But the, the cocoa leaf never produced the concentrated high. In many ways, the drugs of today are the equivalent of a bag of peanut M&Ms. Right. Like, they're simply so concentrated in bliss mm -hmm. that there's nothing that compared to it. It's not that you couldn't eat a peanut before or even have some cacao, right? but nobody imagined the crunchy shell with the sh sugar and the chocolate and the this and that and the other thing. And that's, that's sort of what the cocaine and the heroin are to their predecessor, right? That same logic, though, too, also applies for alcohol, which we culturally accept, right? So in the past, alcohol, um, our, our sort of proclivity as humans for alcohol uh, is probably because alcohol used to help us find food. So when you think about, uh, you know, we're searching the land for, for fruit, uh, fruit would fall from trees, it would ripen on the ground, it would begin to ferment, and mm -hmm. it would put off this sort of funky smell from the alcohol. That would help us find the food. When we actually got the fruit, um, that low level of alcohol in the fruit would help us eat more of it. It's the aperture reef effect, right? So now though, we have, you know, last night at my hotel in Austin, they've got this like big, super long bar and you can see all the bottles and how many of them have the same amount of alcohol that fermented fruit would have. Yeah, pretty None, much zero. Right? We're talking like bourbons that are, you know, 120 proof or whatever. Um, so I think that the more that you scale up and concentrate the psychoactive substances, I think probably um, the more problems you can get into. And so then then there's like this debate, it's like, okay, well, if alcohol is okay, should cocaine, like should the government regulate cocaine and that way we don't have to worry about fentanyl being in it? I mean, that's just like an entire can of worms that um, probably best left for policymakers. So what does the use of methadone um, tell us about how to at least address one of the issues in the scarcity loop if you're trying to help a person who's opioid addicted. Yeah, so one of the things that I think makes drugs so compelling and attractive to people is um, the element of the scarcity loop of unpredictability. So when you think about getting and using any street drug, there's a lot of unpredictable elements in that. Are you gonna be able to find the drug? Are you gonna get in trouble? as you try and find the drug. Uh, once you get the drug, how strong is it gonna be? Is it gonna be really good? Is it gonna be really bad? And then you use it and you know a lot could happen from there. And so with methadone, you find that once you make the drug um, predictable in the sense that like the environment becomes predictable, the timing of when you get it becomes predictable, the dose becomes predictable, you start to see people be able to wane off of drugs. And in fact, people who use methadone often won't get high from the drug. And I think you see this in a lot of pharmaceuticals as well, like the, the addiction rate for uh, prescribed drugs that are controlled where the dose and the timing is controlled. The addiction rates for those are way lower simply because there's no, there's no unpredictability. There's no game behind it. All right, let's pivot a little bit and talk about material possessions. You've alluded to it already because you mentioned how during the pandemic, many of us increased our e-shopping. And um, I suppose like all good addictions, there's an adaptive component to that, right? Like at the beginning of the pandemic, when it was March and April of 2020, I think there was a pretty good reason not to go out. We had no idea what we were dealing with. And the fact that Amazon could deliver things to my door that I used to go out for made complete and total sense. 
And yet, why is it that I probably still buy as much on Amazon now as I did then, if not more? Yeah, I think it, I think there are evolutionary reasons for having more items. Right? If uh, you could get more tools as a person, that probably gave you a survival advantage. Having more items was probably a better idea than having less, especially when you're trying to survive, right? So I think we still have this uh, drive to accumulate stuff. But the difference, of course, is that now we live in a world where we manufacture so much stuff and it's cheaper than ever before. So even just a couple hundred years ago, the average person, for example, owned about three outfits. Now the average person owns 104 outfits and they also only wear 10% of the clothes that they own. So we, <laughs> there's like, I think the stats are 20% of the stuff in our closets. We don't wear it all. I think there's another, uh, I'm going to get the math here wrong, 40% or something that we're like, eh, it's okay. I don't really love it. And then there's a few items where we, I wear them sometimes. And then we're left with 10% where we actually repeatedly wear those items all the time. And that, and that tracks with my own experience. And so I think really um, the difference today is that, you know, we've, we've always had this itch to own things, to possess things, um, but we can never scratch it that often because not only um, things took time to make, because of that, they were more expensive. It was harder to get the resources to make them. And then once the industrial revolution happens, we you know, start cranking out stuff at an amazing rate. Now, again, this kind of goes back to the food thing where it's like, well, this is a good problem to have. But I think you tend to see people collect and collect and collect items. And now the average house, uh, according to one estimate, has anywhere from 10,000 to 40,000 items in it. So we clearly can see a direct and negative consequence to our well-being due to the scarcity loops impact on food, which is for 70% of us, it results in overweight or obesity. And for that subset of the population, there's a nearly doubling of risk in other chronic diseases. So that's like, you might not feel the pain immediately, but there is a real and clear threat to your longevity. What are the downsides of stuff accumulation outside of the extremes? So clearly there are people who have like hoarding diseases and then clearly there are people who could buy so much stuff that it would financially ruin them in the same way a gambler could be ruined. But I suspect that most people listening to this are more like me where they have too much stuff, but it doesn't seem to pose a direct risk to them. Yet I suspect that there's something uh, harmful about it. What, what is that? Well, I do think there's some interesting research that suggests, um, being around too much and clutter. I do think it impacts uh, your ability to focus seems to be related to, um, anxiety, different things. Um, now is it a direct threat? Like, you know, heart disease is no, but, um, I, I think what tends to happen is when you look at why people buy, I think there's basically four reasons. I think the first is um, items are tools. We use them to accomplish a greater goal. This is probably how people would have used things for most of time. Uh, two, we can use them to get status. So you're buying something uh, in order to display something about yourself to others, right? It, it's kind of a status play. It's like no one buys a Rolex because they want to know what time it is. <laughs> <laughs> You're talking to a watch guy here. Well, same here. I'm 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 aware of it. I'm talking I'm talking crap on myself. <laughs> um, and then number three is that we can use goods to belong. So think of um, you know you wear your F1 shirt when you go to the F1 race. Mm -hmm. It's like you're part of this community, and it pulls you into the community. And I think you see that practically um, beyond sports. I mean, certain types of people wear Patagonia. Mm -hmm. Certain types of people wear the Black Rifle Coffee Company shirt, right? We kind of get these tribes that we can uh, identify with via a thing to buy. And then the fourth reason, I think, uh, and I think this was a powerful one during the pandemic, is simply that people are bored. And we today have much faster, easier opportunity to purchase stuff than we ever have before. I mean, even, even 20 years ago, if a person wanted to buy something, if they're bored, um, Shopping you had to actually would, go out and do it. You had to go out and do it. You had to get in your car, 
You had to go to the store. You had to walk the aisles. Go, oh, is this the thing I want? Is this thing there? Like it's a time consuming process. Um, now we can just do it online. We can search Amazon. Not to mention, I think that when you look at how algorithms have evolved, have evolved. I mean, anyone who's ever spent 10 seconds on Instagram, <laughs> they know that that machine knows what they want to purchase more than they do themselves. That's what amazes me. Um, usually when Instagram suggests something to me, it's, it's good. It's good. It's Whereas good. interestingly, Google isn't nearly as good for some reason. I don't know why. Google seems to really suggest dumb things to me I have no interest in, but not Instagram. Yeah, Instagram is very good. Very good. I think it's probably, it probably taps in better to It's probably that culture. you interact with it in a different way, even though mm. I, don't sp I barely spend time on social media. Yeah. But it, it must know when I watch an exercise video, or maybe it knows I'm posting exercise video, it's always suggesting the coolest exercise equipment. And I'm always like, even though I don't have any room for that, I could really use that device. You and I are the same. I get I get exercise contraptions, and I'm sorry to bring up the Grateful Dead again on your podcast, but once I start following all these random Grateful Dead accounts, what am I getting? Oh, yeah. Getting like, oh, you need this shirt from the 1994 tour. It's awesome. I'm like, oh, dang it. Over the pandemic, That's I That's the other thing I get. I get a lot of t-shirt yeah. ads for <laughs> things that I'm clearly doing. Yeah. And so I think that you, you, if you are bored, you can, you know, you might first get bored and you feel that discomfort. And so boredom, I talked about this on the last podcast, talk about it in the comfort crisis, but boredom is this evolutionary discomfort that basically just tells us yeah. whatever you're doing with your time right now, the return on your time is worn thin. So go do something else. Now in the past, um, that something else was often productive. If you think about hunter gatherers, they're going to, if they're not if no animals are coming through when they're hunting, what they're going to do is go, okay, well, maybe we could fish. Maybe we could pick potatoes. Maybe we could pick berries. Today, when we feel that discomfort, we have a lot of very easy, effortless, hyper-stimulating escapes from it in the form of cell phones, in the form of TVs. And so now when you feel it, it's like, okay, pull out your cell phone. Well, I guess I'll open Instagram. I'm scrolling. I'm still bored. Oh, there's that t-shirt I love or that exercise contraption. And then it's like, yeah, I guess I'll buy it. And so... I think you start to see purchases really um, up when we can repeat the behavior faster. So as a general rule, the faster a human can reap, any animal can repeat the behavior, the more likely they are to repeat the behavior. And this is something that came up in um, slot machines in the 80s, as we kind of alluded to. Yeah, I've thought a lot about what you just said with respect to boredom from our first discussion, and I've tried to be more cognizant of it. And uh, in particular, like how uncomfortable I am when I'm bored. and there aren't that many times I get to be bored, but, but you know, this idea that just going places without your phone, which I think is a good practice, right? Like I'm going to go somewhere today and I'm not going to take my phone because I can actually live without it. You know, yeah. I, I can, I, I used to do this. <laughs> there was a day when I, I did this before. Yeah. And then you find yourself in the line at the store without a phone. And it's odd at first. It's really weird. It's like, it's, very it's five minutes where there's nothing to do. Yeah, but I, I also think that you can train yourself to realize that it's an opportunity. Oh yeah, you no, know? it's 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 a it's a it's a beautiful opportunity yeah. to just observe your thoughts, to observe some element of the surrounding. It's actually why, and we've talked, you and I've talked about this. It's why I love rucking, right? It's a no phone zone that yeah. is um, is great. But I, you know, I think there's something different about rucking in that it's so physically challenging or you can make it so physically challenging that the lack of music or stimulation is okay. But so there's something about stillness and otherwise boredom that, that I think can be challenging. And to think that if we didn't have that drive, our species might not have survived. Right. That's, that's a very cool thought to me. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I do think too, to, you know, you asked me, did you sort of adapt to the chamane food? I do think you can adapt to boredom. So for example, you know, in the comfort crisis, I spent all this time in the Arctic and I will say that the boredom was most intense early on in the trip after you've sort of removed yourself from the incoming emails, the screens, the million things that you're normally doing. Um, things start to slow down and you start to calm down and you start to become more observant. And I mean, I will tell you probably the most uh, mentally well I've ever been in my life was after a couple of weeks up in the Arctic, 
because you just, um, you're just dialed in. You just feel so much calmer. And I do think that we, um, live in a world now of hyperspeed. Um, anytime we want to be stimulated, we can do that. And by the way, it's, it's going to be TikTok, right? It's like coming at you fast. Um, so I do think that there's a case for finding time in your life for removal from all that to sort of lean back into boredom. And one of the, one of the things, I guess, issues I've had with a lot of the messaging around how people need to use their cell phone less is that like, yes, that is important. Um, but what tends to happen is when people take an hour off their phone screen time, they go, okay, well, I'm bored. What do I do now? And they turn on Netflix (laughs) and there's no difference. Right. Um, so I advocate for trying to think, how can I infuse boredom back into my life? And really for me, that's, you know, go out, take a walk for 20 minutes, see what happens to your thoughts, be willing to sort of sit with that and see where it leads you beyond the screen because on the screen is what everyone else is getting. And so I think this is particularly great for ideation. You know, I think this is one of the reasons why people have their best ideas in the shower (laughs) because you're not focused on anything. You're just kind of letting your mind wander, do its thing. And then bam, that's the angle, whatever it is. That's the idea. Finishing out this discussion on stuff. Um, my kids have many more toys than I had. And my wife and I talk about this a lot because I kind of live vicariously through them when it comes to Lego. So I just can't stop buying Lego because I love building it with them, watching them build it, creating a huge Lego city. But I wonder, like, is there a downside of this? Because my kids are good kids. Like, I don't feel like they're spoiled brats or anything like that. But like, I only had one Lego and I had to take it apart and put it together and take it apart and put it together, take it apart and together. And the truth of it is, I see them getting bored of Lego. Like they're so conditioned that anytime a new one comes out, dad goes and gets it because he can't wait to see it kind of thing. And I do wonder like, am I doing them a disservice in the long run? Am I depriving them of a scarcity that that I had? There, there's an interesting study I came across when writing this book and it basically, um, it had groups of people and uh, it had them solve a problem. And one group uh, was told they had abundant resources to solve it. They could do all these different things to solve a problem. The other group had scarce resources. And so they had to come up with um, different uses for tools. And what ended up happening is that the group that was faced with more scarce resources, they not only solved the problem, um, but they got more rewards from solving the problem by MacGyvering it, (laughs) right? So when I think about it as applied uh, to Legos, I don't, uh, so in the book I lay out, um, you know, well, how should we think about, like, what's a good way to think about making a purchase? And one of the things that I argue for is framing purchases through the lens of gear, not stuff. So gear is an item that is allowing me to accomplish something that is life-giving, right? It's adding to this experience um, that adds meaning into my life, whereas stuff is often just kind of a purchase to fulfill an impulse. Um, I'm buying something because I think it's going to make me this other person, Mm -hmm. right? It's going to, if I buy this shirt, I'm going to look like this. It's going to be awesome. My life's going to, whatever. You get the point. And so I think when I think about your experience with Legos, that does seem to be adding a real enhancement to your life. Like you're getting this time with your kids where you're building Legos. Um, At the same time, it might be interesting now that you got this pile of Legos from all these killer kits, what could we make with this guys, right? We're not following the, the, the plan here anymore. We're going could we build a castle? What would a castle look like with the resources we have? And I think that that would probably lead them to exercise. Well, um, it's funny you say that. We've already learned that. So when you buy the kit, they love to build the thing, but then they like to keep it and play with Mm -hmm. it as is. Mm -hmm. But where they get far more enjoyment is the loose Lego pile. So you go to Lego store, you can buy loose Lego. And then there's a store called bricks and minifigs where they just, it's just a free for all. And the the mo- they spend 80% of their time building a city that is huge i'll show you after the podcast you will awesome. find it hilarious it's taken up our basement and it's just made from the loose lego and it's their own stuff so like every month we go get more pieces they add another floor to the condo you know they've built like the grocery store where i print out like HEB is the grocery store in Texas. So like 
I've, pr I've made and laminated HEB signs that then stick on their grocery stores and all this other stuff. So I think you're right. I think they're, <clears throat> they must be getting more enjoyment out of that because it's where they're putting more time. Yeah. Um, as part of the book, I talk about the value of exploration. So, um, you know, this feeds into information in that I think humans have a desire for information, right? If you, in the past, if you were the person who had more information, if you could crave information and try and get it, try to cure these uncertainties, I would give you a survival advantage. Now we're still wired to crave information. And I think that anyone has experienced this practically, you know, anytime you get a itch in your side and you're going, oh my gosh, am I dying? No, you know, you're going down WebMD. Like we know we want information. Twitter wouldn't work if people weren't information hoarders. But I think the difference between how we acquired information in the past and how we acquire it, acquire it today is that in the past, you had to go there in the present moment to learn something. It was a mind body effort to get a piece of information, right? Is there greener grass over there? Well, you have to go to the other side to see if there is greener grass and it's very up in the air. Um, there's a lot of uncertainties, but by going through that mind body process outdoors, um, that real roll of the dice, you get more value from that when you realize, oh, we found this greener grass, this is great. And I think today, because we can Google so much, we still have this information itch, but we scratch it um, online. So now I think that people's experiences of their day-to-day -day life oftentimes get mediated by uh, information from other people. So what do I mean by that? Okay, when is the last time that you went to a restaurant just cold, right? You just picked a random restaurant. You didn't read the Yelps from five different people. You didn't read all the reviews. You didn't look at the menu. You didn't kind of go, oh, well, that looks like a good table. Hopefully we can get that one. Now, by doing that, when you get to that restaurant, your experience in there has totally changed. Totally changed, right? because you now have expectations. You have expectations from, you know, Jim Smith 99 on Yelp because he told you to get the trout, but hold the almond sauce or whatever it is. Um, <laughs> and I think that that changes us. And I think that there is a case now for trying to re-explore the world like we used to, right? It's, can you go into situations totally cold? And what will that be like? What sort of value will you get from that internally by doing this thing that no one told you about. You don't have any expectations going in and you are just having this totally uh, unadulterated moment that is in the present moment. And it's of course not just restaurants. It's like watching a movie, right? Reading a book, uh, listening to an album, going to a different part of town, right? There's all these different ways that you can have these sort of uh, more momentous occasions in your life um, without necessarily needing to follow the <laughs> metaphorical Lego plan. To the point of your kids is yeah. why I'm talking about this. <laughs> On that topic of information and exploration, um, <clears throat> you, you write about how Homo sapiens were really the breakoff point to true exploration uh, in terms of distance traveled, uh, risk taken, etc. I was thinking about it after I read that, and I, I don't know if you have a point of view or a thought as to why, for example, Neanderthals didn't do the same. They were bigger than us, stronger than us, had bigger brains than us and could walk upright. In other words, they had all the tools that would have provided for the same, if not greater exploration capacity as Homo sapiens. Do we have a sense of what changed? Yeah, we, I mean, we are fascinating in that in basically 50,000 years, we took over the world, right? <laughs> uh, Neanderthals were around a long time and they just kind of were in the same place yeah. most of the time. Not to mention that, but once we take over the world, we go... All right, well, let's put some highways on this thing. And maybe we should build a uh, launch pad for a spaceship and go up into outer space. And oh, what's what's in that water, right? Let's build a submarine. Um, so we are uh, fascinating that way. Was that just something that randomly got selected for in the in the change to Homo sapien, and then it just got rewarded and rewarded and rewarded? Like, is there no other structural reason for it I other than so. just I mean, Darwin? It's part of the book. I looked at, um, there's a little bit of evidence of this gene that is nicknamed the exploration uh, gene. And um, it seems to be around in populations that move a lot more. So it's uh, far more prevalent in nomads. It's far more prevalent uh, in societies that would have traveled farther um, from our origins in East Africa. And so that, there's probably some reason there. But I think ultimately, um, you know, we're a species that 
and most animals are like this, you do the the good thing, right? So there's some inherent reason why we would have kept moving. And maybe it's just that we get internal rewards from that. So what do we owe a gratitude or despair to Benjamin Day for? Oh, man. Okay, so before 1830, newspapers cost six cents. Uh, they tend to cover business and politics and, uh, they're weekly. So Benjamin Day comes in and he goes, all right, I want to, I want to create a paper that gets like a lot of readers because six cents is a lot of money back then. So he goes, all right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a newspaper and I'm going to sell it for one cent. Now I'm selling it at a loss. So I have to make up uh, my loss somehow. So what do I do? What if I went to some companies and said, hey, I will publish stuff about your brand in my newspaper and people will see it and they'll buy your stuff. That is to say, this guy really started advertising, the advertising model. So once he does that, though, you can charge more money for your advertisements the more readers you have. Okay, so how do we do that? Because we're at a loss right now. The more readers we have, the more money we can make off of each ad. That's how we're making our money. Well business and politics is kind of boring, right? Business is a little bit boring. So what this guy does is uh, by dropping the price to one cent, he's selling at a loss, but more people will be able to buy it so he can get a bigger audience. And then second, what he does is he starts covering sort of murder, mayhem, <laughs> affairs, fights, all these different things that attract attention. So this is when you start to see the real shift from us, from newspapers covering this sort of nice, boring things to this guy going, um, literally he ran a headline that was bathed in blood and it was about this, you know, murder suicide in New York City. So he starts to publish uh, every single day for one penny and the headlines are always crazy gore. And I think this is when you start to see the attention economy in which we now live really start to take off. And it's the same deal, you know, in order to make a, in order to make money off an ad model, you have to get as many eyes as possible and they have to be certain eyes. And the way you do that is often by running information that is uh, negative, that is lurid, that is going to capture information that's going to capture as much attention as possible. And, uh, you know, for example, still today, 90% of news tends to be negative. Now this holds whether or not the world is improving or not. Right. So we could, things could be much better than they were a hundred years ago, but we're still having, our papers are still 90% negative news. Yeah. And, and again, there's an evolutionary basis for negativity bias, right? You could make the case for how we were far, we are far better off evolutionarily to pay attention to negative signals rather than positive signals. Yeah. The negative thing is what could kill you. That demands your attention. The positive thing is great, but it, doesn't need as much attention in the moment. Right, exactly. If you're the person who's uh, looking at how beautiful the flowers are as the saber-toothed tiger walks up this way, you're not gonna, you're not gonna live that long. God, it is, it is so incredible to think that natural selection being such an amazing tool could have no appreciation for what would come with modernity <laughs> right. and how it would render so many things maladaptive. Yeah. And I think this is, you know, the best example of this is with a lot of social media companies and how algorithms work. You know, if you let those things run their course, things that get the most traction tend to be the most uh, lurid, crazy things, you know, and I think that that is one of the main reasons um, we're so polarized as a country today is that moral outrage is particularly uh, great at capturing attention. And those things get upvoted because they're going to get more eyes. And while that is uh, good for bringing in eyes and making money for a social media company, it's not necessarily good for society always. So you wrote in the information chapter about a study that was done on the social media use of politicians. Yeah. <laughs> what did you learn? So this kind of goes back, this, this uh, goes back to quantification and um, how there are some downsides to quantifying everything and gamifying everything. But the long story short of that study is basically that when politicians first get onto Twitter and they, uh, the scientists analyzed, use an AI algorithm to analyze all the tweets of about 10 years uh, of politician tweets. And what they found is that when politicians would first get onto Twitter, it was like, they would use, hey, we're having a fundraiser, blah, 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 you know, um, nice things, relatively benign. 
But once they would tweet something negative that was attacking another person, they would start to get more likes and retweets. And that in turn would feel good, right? So it would tell them, oh, this works on this platform. This is what you need to do on this platform to get these points, because this is how we are scoring our behavior on this platform. And then from there, you started to see the number of negative tweets from them increase over time, because that's what gets rewarded on social media. And so, uh, you know, this probably isn't an accurate reflection of maybe who these people really are or what we really want in society. Do we want our politicians being terrible human beings on Twitter? I don't think so. It's interesting. Imagine um, a thought experiment where Twitter and social media ran exactly the same as now, except the person who was commenting was blinded to the uh, feedback from others. So likes and retweets, for example. So if you put out something, you could put it out and everybody could still see it just as they do. But if they liked it or retweeted it, you wouldn't see that. How do you think that would change things? Well, it wouldn't train. I mean, so is there to back up is that's human training, right? The algorithm trains us how to use it, how to behave and use the social media, uh, platform. So I don't see a huge difference between when I go stand by the treat jar and I say stocked and sit and my dog puts his butt on the floor and I give him a treat. He knows to do that. Right. Well, when I go on social media and I tweet, um, some crazy thing, say, I don't actually do that, but I treat some crazy thing and all you other humans go like, like, like that tells me, Oh, if I want the good thing, whether it's my dog with a treat or the likes on social media, I got to do that thing, whether it's sitting or writing, Donald Trump is an idiot, Hillary Clinton's an idiot, so-and-so is an idiot, right? Um, I don't see much difference between that. Really, you get trained on these based on um, how the system is set up with likes and retweets and followers. So that's a long way of saying, I think you'd probably see less of that training occur. Yeah. So we want, how do we reconcile this, right? We have evolved to want information. Have we evolved to want the truth? That's a good question. Um, I think that, so there's this guy I talked to whose name is um, T. Wynn, and he is a philosopher at the University of Utah. And he talked a lot about how, you know, we sort of evolved to trust um, when we feel like we'd gotten the right information. It gives us this sort of aha moment. So we have a question. We find what we believe is the answer and we go, aha, that feels good. This makes sense. Um, things were probably pretty clear in the past, right? You either got the food that was going to lead you to survive or you didn't. You either found shelter or you didn't. So you could trust that. Aha, here's the food. But I think in today's age, whenever we have a question, we can go seeking out information from a lot of different sources and we can get that aha moment whether or not the information is factually correct or not. So here's a, here's a good example is that, you know, why do, uh, why are conspiracy theories compelling? Because they give you an aha moment. Conspiracy theories, they might seem complicated and they often are, right? You got the big board and you got all the strings and it's like this person, this person, right? But at the end of the day, you have a very specific answer for why this thing is the way it is right? It clears up any ambiguity. When in reality, most things in life are very uncertain. They're very amb ambiguous. We don't fully understand why a certain thing has ever happened. But if you can sort of provide someone with an aha, that is going to give them a feeling of clarity, a feeling of certainty, and they can rely on that to make decisions, whether or not the information is ac actually accurate. Yeah. I think people also find conspiracy theories um, appealing when they provide a grand narrative to something to which the truth is insignificant. Uh, to me, the, the best example of this, because it happens to be one of the conspiracy theories I've gone down the rabbit hole on, is the assassination of JFK. And um, I, I can say this, I'm sure I will enrage a subset of the listeners, like every available shred of reasonably good evidence, if you actually understand ballistics, and Unfortunately, my training in surgical uh, residency taught me a lot about what bullets do when they hit people. 
everything points to a single shooter. Everything points to three shots being fired by Lee Harvey Oswald. By the way, it wasn't hard shooting. That's the other thing that's like, there's no way he could have got, no, no, no. Like, these were the easiest three shots in the world. He killed JFK. Um, why do we have to have so many conspiracies? Because how can we accept that such an insignificant, irrelevant human being like Lee Harvey Oswald could alter the course of history? That's impossible for most of us to wrap our minds around. It's much easier to think that the CIA had to do this because of pick your favorite Oliver Stone idiotic reason. Um, and so, I, yeah, I think that also, like, I wonder how that factors into us as storytellers and, and the need to, you know, have sort of information. Again, I don't know if there's an evolutionary basis for that, but but I think that that also plays a role in, in people always. And again, I, I think some conspiracy theories turn out to be true, right? So it's not always that the, that the, that the first answer is, is right or the first answer is wrong. This kind of gets to another issue, right? Which is, and I think Nguyen brings this up, which is the idea that we should think of food and information as analogous where too much fast food is bad for you. Too much loose information without nuance is bad for you. Yeah. So he, yeah, he compared it, compared it to food where if you give up on a food's nutritional quality, it's very easy to make very delicious tasting food, seductively good food. Um, and the same as with information. If something just feels really good, really tasty, you should probably use that as a sign to maybe investigate the issue further, to look to look at the what the other side is saying. Right. If you're willing to sacrifice truth and nuance, you can have the most seductive information possible. Yeah. If you're willing to sacrifice nutrition, nutritional quality, you can have the most delicious food possible. I think it's a beautiful analogy. Yeah, exactly. And it is so easy to find anything online today. And there's you know, in the book, I talk about how there's uh, answers to the most sort of mundane questions that we could have in daily life, like product reviews. You know, what is the best pillowcase? It's like, this is, you know, this is the epitome of a first world problem. But here, I'm going to spend 800 words of my time reading this story about what is the best pillowcase, you know, <laughs> and it, they're just all over the board. We have so many experts. We have so much information. Um that I think we have more, you know, maybe knowledge in the world, but we don't necessarily have more understanding and more of an understanding of like, how should I actually spend my time? Do I want to go down the, you know, the hour long review, uh, review sites on pillowcases or whatever the item might be. And you can apply this to so many different things. I mean, you know, your background, I mean, does, does WebND ever really help a person like figure out <laughs> what's going on or does it just lead them to go, Oh, definitely stage four cancer. Yeah, yeah, I th I think that's a very fair uh, comparison. What what is the? I don't want to say solution, but what what would be a tool you could recommend to somebody who's listening to us talk about this and acknowledging it and saying, you know what? Come to think of it, I'm a bit of an information addict, and I'm I'm at a point where my innate desire for information is becoming maladaptive because it's being applied in a manner that, you know, just as my natural and adaptive behavior to seek food has become maladaptive, I'm in the same place information wise. How, how would you suggest a person cope with that? Yeah, I do think that information falls into that scarcity loop that I talked about, right? You've, you're looking for this piece of information that you think is going to improve your life, but you don't know where it is. And so you search and search the web. And then when you find it, it's like, bingo great, I found it. And then you can sort of quickly repeat. So I think one way that you can slow down um, any behavior you do in excess or reduce the frequency is to sort of slow it down. So there's this interesting study that I talk about in the book where they had a group of um, students, they had two groups, they had them both figure out the answer to a question. Now, the first group could use the internet. And right? so they go online, they search it, they find it really fast, great. The second group, could not use the internet. So they had to use books. So they got to go to the library. They got to walk the stacks. They got to find the book. Mm -hmm. And then they got to open the figure out where the information is in the book. They go, okay, I got it. They return back. Um, not only did they have slightly better information, but more importantly, they were better able to recall it later on. Um, when they were tested on it, they did uh, better. So I think that there is an argument for 
a shift to slow information when you really want to understand something, right? Because these people were better able to put it into context. Now, most people are going to listen to that and say it makes sense, but I'm never going to get up off my desk and go to the public library and look at the stacks. So is there a way that you can toggle between fast and slow information still using the internet, for example? Yeah, I think... Um so I think kind of the metaphor there is like, if you do really want to understand something, realize you're probably going to have to put in a little bit more work. It can't be a quick Google search. Now, at the same time, the, the... that's how I justify the existence of this podcast, by the <laughs> yeah. way, is if you really want to understand a topic, yeah, that's we're... why I, I try not to make too many apologies for the fact that we have three hour episodes. Yeah. I think that a useful heuristic is to, if you've got just a random everyday question, it's not of much consequence in your life. Um, try to make the decision in 60 seconds, right? You search for the information you want to know. Okay, found it in 60 seconds. Yeah, that's probably right. You know, how do I get to Arby's? Bam, there you go. Um, what pillowcase should I buy? Pick in 60 seconds, right? Pick something, just pick something because eventually you're wasting time. Uh, I had a, I have a story in the book about how when I was an intern at Esquire way back in the day, <laughs> um, I had, I got this assignment and it was okay. Find out how much money the Pope makes. And I go, okay, that's my job. I'm going to find out how much money the Pope makes. So I end up searching around online. Um, I even called up some Catholic academic and, you know, he was kind of like, oh, I think it's this much, whatever. So I send in the research file to my editor and I get an email back and it just says, meet me in the conference room in five minutes. So I get up I go into the conference room and this was at the Hearst building in New York, mm -hmm. which is where Esquire is. And so... Now we're looking down the barrel of eighth Avenue and he's sitting at this long table and very Esquire guy, you know, he has the button down, the tie is loose. Um, he goes, sit down. I say, okay, I go sit by him and he, he just looks at me, starts shaking his head, leans back and he goes, no, 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 no. If you want to know how much money the Pope makes, you call the fucking Vatican, call the fucking Vatican. So the point is, I had totally missed the most obvious answer to that, right? If you want to know something about a person, ask the person. <laughs> but instead, we'd have now all these sort of kooky ways to go around it. So I think it's, uh, I think the metaphor is like, if you can really just go to the source in a way, uh, do that, right? Read the study if you hear someone online saying that, you know, I don't know, oatmeal is totally toxic and blah, blah, blah. And like, oh, by the way, you're probably going to have to learn to read a study. Luckily, you provide information like that that is useful. Uh, if you want to know what a person thinks, maybe ask them. Look about look at what they've written on a thing. Watch the full interview in context, right? You see someone say something that seems crazy in a 30-second Instagram clip, it's like, okay, well, maybe we should get the first like five minutes and the last five minutes after that. So we kind of know what the context is. And you'll probably find that it's taken out of context and like it's being used against the person. Right. So I think it is so easy to get such quick, seductive information. You want to do a little more work for the things that you really want to understand and not jump to conclusions. Like we've seen so many, I mean, for example, media outlets get in trouble because they publish all these op-eds about, you know, a 30 second Instagram clip, like with the Covington Catholic. And now they owe the kid $250 million because we jumped to conclusions on a 30 second video clip. So the last section of the book is on happiness, um, which I actually found probably the, the the chapter that I was thinking the most about, right? It was the one where I would pause the most and reflect and think and, and stuff like that. So I'll start with arguably the most difficult question, which is how do you define happiness? Well, I can tell you that I had the same question <laughs> and I still do have the same question. I'll tell you what the, the dictionary says. I think it says, um, joy, a feeling of joy. And there's one other word, maybe like felicity or something like that. So you go, oh, okay. Well, what does joy mean? You go to joy, it goes a feeling of happiness. <laughs> so it's circular, right? Uh, and I think that you see people define happiness in all different ways. So I think it was uh, Seneca who said, it's uh, not having anxiety about the future, feeling okay in the moment, not having anxiety about the future. Uh, you know, John Lennon, the famous uh, song, happiness is a warm gun, right? Um, I think it's hard to define. And it's also one of those things where um, 
maybe we don't even know it when we are happy, but we can look back and be like, oh, that was a happy moment in my life. Like it's this very, very murky thing. And yet we all want to be happy, right? That is sort of the, uh, the capital G goal of most of the things we do. We take a drink because we think it's going to make us happy. We make buy this purchase because we think it's going to make us happy. Um, we seek out that information on WebMD because we think that if we know what this thing is, that'll give us some relief, right? Um, but it is a very confusing topic. And I think maybe we know a little bit less about it than we think. Where does happiness fit on Maslow's hierarchy of need? Is I mean, is it, I know self-actualization is about the fourth rung, but where does happiness actually fit into it? I don't think it does. I mean, it's got the, uh, I don't think so. Does it? I, I don't think so. I don't, but I, but I haven't looked at it in a very long time. Yeah. Um, I dove into that, um, a bit in the book, but I can't recall. I don't think it was at the, I don't think it was on there. So that seems a little odd, isn't it? Because depending on how you define happiness, it does seem like a very high order goal. Yeah, it is a high order goal. But of course, I guess he's not defining it as a need. And maybe that's why it doesn't belong there. So for this chapter, I what made me write this chapter is sort of realizing that, um, you know, we all want more happiness. Sort of the book looks at what are these things that we all want more of? Um, how have they changed over time? And I think that um, while most of the chapters say, you know, we had a scarcity of this thing. Now we have a massive abundance of it. I don't know if that's necessarily held for happiness in a lot of ways, right? So one great example is that uh, from 1979 to 1999, you saw uh, real income in, uh, grow by about 43% among Americans. And you know, we didn't actually become any happier, right? So if we think that, you know, progress and money is always going to make us happier, I don't think that that is the case. When do you think peak happiness occurred? Because like, I often think that on my worst day, I'm so happy to be alive today and to have not have been alive 200 years ago or 2000 years ago or 20,000 years ago. Now, you know, that's a bit of a dumb thing to say, I know, because I have no idea what it was like to be alive 20,000 years ago when you don't know what today feels like. So in other words, you know, getting eaten alive by mosquitoes and ants every day while you scavenge for food, if you don't know what this is, is just what it is. So I get that one can't make that statement, but do the people who attempt to study this have a sense of when peak happiness occurred for our species? Uh, not that I've come across. I mean, I do know that we are seeing decreases in happiness in the data. A lot of the data suggests that people are becoming less happy. Um, honestly, I would imagine that probably as we've gotten more technology in a way, it's like technology improves your life and happiness to a certain point. And then at a certain point, it begins to constrain you and that could potentially make you more unhappy. So Arthur Brooks has, has written a lot about happiness and I, I have found the way Arthur writes about it to be the the best way for me to think about it because a, he doesn't write about happiness as a feeling. And that's, I think the problem with the dictionary definition and why it's circular because happiness points to a feeling of joy and joy points to a feeling of happiness. But instead he really writes about components or what he describes the macronutrients of happiness. Um, and so, uh, enjoyment being one of them and enjoyment being a much deeper thing than pleasure, right? Pleasure being purely sensory enjoyment, being more cerebral and really having this essential component of being shared with others. Um, and then he talks about satisfaction, which of course is the most fleeting of them, but is highest when there is a struggle. Right. So this goes back to many of the examples you've already given, which is if you get something easily, it's not very satisfying. If you have to work very hard to achieve something, it's more satisfying. But probably for very important evolutionary reasons, we can't keep satisfaction. And that's what keeps us striving. Um, and then the final what he again, he calls macronutrient is sense of purpose. Um, and again, without that, that we can't have true happiness. And I, I honestly think of that as to date the best model I have encountered 
Now you, to study this, continued your incredible <laughs> journey of going yeah. and doing really hard things. So what did you seek out in the pursuit of happiness? So I go to, long story short, is I spent a week at a Benedictine monastery in the mountains of New Mexico. And so then you have to ask, well, okay, why, why the hell would you go there? <laughs> <laughs> and the answer is because, you know, I, we do kind of live in a world where there's a lot of these uh, different things we're supposed to be doing for our happiness. And they're often backed by research, right? It's uh, you got to meditate, you got a gratitude journal, you got to have as many friends as possible, blah, blah, blah. And, um, you know, that all seems great. But when you look at these Benedictine monks, what I find so fascinating about them is that they go against a lot of the happiness sort of research that's in pop culture right now. Um, they live a pretty hard life. <laughs> they get up at 3 a.m., start to pray. They don't eat a lot of food, so they're not getting you know the pleasure from uh, meals. They're also in silence most of the time. They do hard labor four hours every single day. They're not entirely social, right? Because it's the silence and they often work alone. But when researchers have done and these- And no, no, they're celibate. There's no relationships. Yeah. <laughs> no relationship. Yeah, no romantic relationships. Um, no real access to the outside world in terms of, you know, they're not on Facebook and keeping up with the news that way. It's a lot of, um, their motto is aura et labora, which is pray and work, <laughs> right? And so what's interesting though is that there's a researcher whose name is Alex Bishop, who's done a lot of- uh, research on them and their happiness levels. And they seem to be happier than the average American, despite all these hardships that they face in their life, despite all these sort of crazy and necessary things they seem to be doing, they wind up significantly happier than us when we have access to all these things that should make us, you know, feel great in the moment. So I go and I live with them for a week. And I think the, my main takeaway for them really goes back to uh, what Arthur was saying is that if something is uh, challenging to get, I think we get more rewards from that. And that also makes sense from an evolutionary perspective. I talked to a guy, his name is Thomas Zentall, and he explained that there's probably, the reason for this is probably, you know, if you had to search and search and search for food and like you weren't finding it, um, but you persisted and persisted and persisted, and then you find the food, that has to be inherently more rewarding than the food that was very easy to come by in order to incentivize future searches when you get in that situation. Um, so it's that doing hard uh, work and not necessarily having everything given to you, I think becomes rewarding for humans. Um, the other thing that I think is important about them is they're not necessarily in it for themselves. Right? They've given their lives over to this higher ideal, even though it does uh, require a lot of sacrifice. So for them, that higher idea is God, right? They're trying to get out of themselves. Um, they're trying to help others and help this greater idea. Um, and it doesn't ultimately all come back to them. And I think that um, there's a lesson in there for the average person that is, you know, what sort of thing can you do to get out of yourself and find some greater meaning and purpose beyond just your next desire? Yeah, it's funny. Like I, <laughs> and I know that that chapter isn't written to suggest that that's the answer. That hey, if you're reading this, but you don't feel really happy, there's a there's a there's a monastery for you, and you're gonna go and wake up at three thirty every morning, do your first prayers, go and work, go and do your second prayers, go and eat, go and do your next prayers, go and work. I mean, it it was the most unpleasant. Th reading it made me uncomfortable. I was like. I would kill myself. The work part I would get, the prayer part would kill me. I was like, I, I, I just think I would lose my mind. So um, clearly that's not what you're proposing, but it's an interesting contrast and example. But yet I still wonder what it is that, which element is missing for most of us, right? Because I've met some people who, you know, have a have an amazing sense of purpose. They're very mission driven to to their work, to their technology, to their company, whatever it is they're doing. Um, they struggle and strive and succeed, and that's short lived. And then they do it again and again and again. Um, and they also seem to enjoy themselves, right? They 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 do 
do lavish things and they and they and they share the company of others and yet ostensibly they don't seem that happy um so these guys conversely like you could argue their sense of purpose is i don't know they're not really serving the world like if every one of these monasteries went away the world would continue to turn on its axis you can't say that for many professions right like if every janitor went away tomorrow the world would grind to a halt right like think about it right if we had one week of every sanitation person stop working we couldn't function in society so so like even if your job is cleaning you have a really significant purpose um again I, not to disparage the monks but it's like they're in their own bubble where they're self-sufficient right they do everything for themselves but is that the purpose is it that they help each other I, I i'm still struggling to understand how they're happy yeah i think they help each other i know they do a lot of work in the community mm -hmm. as well so they help the community um i also wonder i mean i even wonder things like about the pace of their life you know it's um it's definitely slower than we live now um it's it's to me what it really suggests is that there is no perfect plan for happiness and in fact by trying to be happy <laughs> that's not a great way to be happy mm. <laughs> right if you're trying to figure out what is the next thing i can do to get to be happy <laughs> and so you google how to be happy and it says oh well this study said this you need to start a gratitude journal it's like Okay, that might help a few people, but the reality is, is that it's so much more complicated than something that can just be sort of distilled down into like, here are these quick actionables. Um, but I do think the commonality you see is that um, people who tend to be happy, they tend to be do something that they believe is of service and is going to a greater good. So even though if they all disappeared, yeah, the world would turn go on, but maybe they believe they have what they're doing has consequence in some yeah. afterlife and to your I point see. yeah I, good good point they and, must obviously if they're right obviously if they're there yeah, yeah and so i think that um you know the takeaway is that you do need to it's probably useful for happiness to find something that is greater than yourself if you're doing the next sort of fulfilling your next impulse that's probably not not going to be good for you over the long run um austerity sometimes is a key to uh being happy because you knew you know these times where what it was like right it's like with the with the gratitude journals it's like okay that's great but the best way to feel grateful for something is to be deprived of it for a while and these monks really practice that for example with food so they you know they do not eat a lot and then every now and then on like a saint's birthday they get these festivals where it's, okay, we got a lot of food. This is going to be great. We're eating things we don't. And like, this becomes this moment where they're like, oh, I really appreciate this food that I worked hard to, to bring to us, you mm. know? And I think that um, without having to put in effort or never being deprived of anything, you just normalize to whatever you have. It doesn't matter if you have the base model 2001 Honda Civic or the brand new Ferrari, right? If that's, <laughs> if that's your thing, that's what you're going to normalize to. Yeah, absolutely. Um how much do you think that the following cycle is on an inevitable loop in society and that and this could be across multiple time scales so so hard times make hard men hard men make soft times soft times make soft men soft men make hard times is that the is that the cycle of our species I think it, I mean, I, I definitely think it's, it's reasonable. I think you see it, uh, historically I do. What I think is so interesting about now is that, um, I think things change faster than ever. Uh, people are changing how we spend our time is changing faster than ever. And, um, I do wonder how that's affecting us. I mean, so I'm a professor at UNLV and I've seen changes in my students over the past seven years. Right? You would normally think that a change in behavior, a big change in behavior noticeably, would probably take generations to pop up. But I've definitely seen changes, and I think it is um, simply because of how we spend our time and attention. More online. You are the product of your attention. Right. Fewer in-person interactions, um, all those sorts of things. What do you make of the difference between solitude and loneliness as you gathered it from this experience? Yeah, well, you know, I think that um, 
probably for good reason. There's a lot of information out about how, you know, it's good to have um, friends, to be social. Um, I also think that there's a lot of people, <laughs> or maybe we don't need as many as we've been told. I think that um, you need what is called anticipatory support, which is basically someone or some bigger idea that you can count on. But in terms of having this big bevy of friends, I don't think that that is necessary for happiness. I think that having certain people that you can count on, basically, um, and having maybe one good relationship is better than a bunch of mediocre ones. So when it comes to being alone and being in solitude, I think the difference between um, loneliness or aloneness is that you didn't necessarily choose that, right? You want to be with people, but you're not able to, for whatever reason. Um, Whereas solitude is using this time, like you're, you're consciously taking this time to be alone with yourself and use it, um, maybe to get to know yourself better. So when you look at, um, some of the happiest people who we consider the happiest and most enlightened in history, a lot of them spent a lot of time alone, right? Jesus walked out into the desert for 40 days. The Buddha walked the earth for six years or whatever it was. Um, and when you look at a lot of those writings, I don't think that they say, oh, this whole, you know, 40 days or six years was entirely blissed out. You know, it's hard to be alone, but I think, but by going through that and being like, okay, well, why is it hard? You can get to know yourself and get to sort of deeper revelations about yourself. And I think that's a narrative that you see across different faiths and history that sometimes people need to go through, um, Solitude is a way to gain insight into themselves. And once they do that, you can then come back into society and you're better able to function in it because you're now more self-reliant. And really, I think what um, makes a good human is someone who can be reliant on themselves and can in turn help others. You, you write in the, the chapter, and it might even be in the epilogue, that um, for most of us, our will to live is no longer really a vital part of our existence. In fact, this was in the epilogue, if I recall, because I believe you wrote about it in the context of learning survival skills prior to going into Baghdad. And so I, I, was, I was really struck by that because it, it really resonates, right? Like, I don't know, I can certainly think of times when I've exerted my will, but I don't really think about it in terms of will to live and yet, for all of human history, that was a thing. Like, again, you think about that snake jumping out of the jungle, or you think about, you know, the complete lack of food, or the dysentery you just got that, you know, like, there's so many areas where the will to live must have been one of the strongest selective features of our existence. And yet today, it's never put to the test. What is the implication of that? Well, I think it's easy to just sort of exist and not, and not live. So uh, I'll tell you my experience of this is uh, before I go to Baghdad, I realized, okay, I should probably learn some skills should things go south, which, you know, there's a much higher likelihood of something going south in Baghdad than there is if I were to, to your point, report on, you know, drugs in Ohio or something. So I go meet uh, my friend whose name is Mike Moreno. Um, he's a VC guy, but before that, he spent a bunch of years in the CIA in Baghdad running operations. So he takes me out to the desert in uh, outside of San Diego, and we go through all these different skills I'm going to need to know uh, in order to survive should something go wrong while I'm there. And at the end of the day, so we spend eight hours, like, here's all these ways you could die, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> at the end of the day, we're sitting on the tailgate of his SUV and he looks over at me and he goes, man, I'm really jealous that you're going there. And when he says that to me, I look at him, I'm like, we just talked about like how this is not a good idea in many ways. And yet you're wanting to go back. What's up with that? And he says, you know, I really, what I miss most about my time there is because it was uh, austere it was dangerous. You did have to be present and focused on what was around you. I found that extremely life-giving, right? You were thrust into the moment and you really had to exercise this sort of will to live. And I said, okay. And once I got back from Baghdad, I totally understood that. 
like I will remember every moment of being there because it is, you can't just zone out, right? I can't on the way here in the Uber, I pop in my headphones. I just sort of, you know, whatever. Um, I can't do that there. I'm looking around at everything. I'm aware every interaction becomes um, important. I'm having to make judgment calls in the moment. There is some underlying level of danger and that in turn, that uncertainty forces me into presence and awareness and makes my time consequential. And I think that is life-giving. And I think we do not have that in a way, which is a good problem to have. <laughs> Don't get me wrong here. That is a good problem to have. But I think when you think about the context, your point of how humans evolved, we live like that all the time because we didn't know where our next meal might come from very often. We didn't know what the weather would bring. We didn't know what was happening next. And we were having to really work and uh, struggle to survive. And there is probably something rewarding to that and to be in the moment and to have to work to get the things that you get really on a deep level and be just kind of in it, like you are in it, you know? And um, yeah, so I think that the takeaway for the average person is how is not to go to Baghdad, let me say that. <laughs> it is, how can you do things in your life that maybe reflect that a little bit? I mean, I think maybe, uh, you know, we both like hunting. I definitely get that from hunting. You have to be present. You have to be focused. You have to be aware. It's not exactly comfortable. Um, I think people can get that from all sorts of things that they can do outdoors. Could be from volunteering. Like, I'm going to go to this place. I'm going to help others. I'm going to go down to this place. I'm going to serve others, right? Something that sort of puts you in the moment and makes you aware, I think, is important for happiness. Well, Michael, congratulations again on the book. Uh, it's great. I, I'm not going to ask you what, what you have percolating in your mind, but I'm pretty sure you already have an idea for what the next book is. So, uh, glutton, I, glutton for punishment. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but I suspect that whatever you work on next will be an evolution of this type of thinking because it's clear you've really found um, a sweet spot around exploring these important topics which I think both scratch kind of the investigative journalist itch, which is you're basically learning a whole bunch of things in the field. But on top of that, there's a really practical takeaway for any one of us who reads it. So um, I suspect uh, a lot of people listening to this are going to feel like we scratched a little bit of the itch, but they're going to go and need to read Scarcity Brain. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. And then um, I'll work on you so you can do your second book. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Thank you. <laughs>